friends, friends, friends. <laughs> uh, I hope you are well today. Um, I am in PJs because I'm going to be writing all day today. I've got, um, I had my last couple classes and I have two papers and a final left and they're big mm -hmm. papers. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. Um, Mandy, I'm so glad to see your face. It is a welcome break from reading about Jesus. And I appreciate <laughs> you very, very much. Listen, and I apologize for my pajama self. You look exactly like you should look. There we go. Being in the position that you're in right now. Yep. Yep. You should look no other way. <laughs> Well, it's been quite the week. Um, I can't wait to hear about your week and all the things. Um, but I thought I'd start us off uh, with a little controversy. As we do. I don't know if y'all have heard. <laughs> uh, but the um, college football world is all a tizzy these days. Um, first, let me start by saying I am so thrilled. I am so thrilled. I am beyond thrilled that we can now move to an era where Chris Fowler and Kurt Herbstreit can call all our games. <laughs> <laughs> we are done with CBS at 3.30 and Gary Danielson. God, help us all. Um, I am so excited for one main reason. And that is that I know Kurt Herbstreit is an Ohio State fan. And I really don't care what kind of fan Chris Fowler is. But they don't let that get in the way of calling a game that is fair. And they don't talk about other teams the entire time during someone else's game. I mean, and you know, they, it's not too much to ask to talk about so. the teams on the field. They're genuinely excited about a, about watching good football. And they just love football, just like the rest of us. And so I'm just thrilled that we get to uh, play along with them from now on. On the other side of college football, um, the college playoff choices are slightly controversial. I don't know if y'all have heard anything about it. I mean, there's no winning, I don't think, for the college football playoff committee. I think any choice that they made was going to get an uproar, but they picked the one that got the most uproar imaginable. Yeah. I will say I listened um, on Friday to a podcast. So uh, ESPN puts out a podcast every day. I think it's called ESPN Daily, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy that used to host that is a guy named Pablo Torre. And Pablo left um, maybe in the summer. And he has now started his own podcast. And it's called Pablo Torre Knows It All or Pablo Torre Finds Out or something. Mm. If, you, if you search for Pablo um, on Apple, it'll pop up. But he interviewed, <laughs> he interviewed a guy, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he's um, he played college football. He played in the NFL, but now he is a math professor at MIT. Mm. <laughs> um, and okay. that, guy, that guy was on the uh, committee up until this year. He rolled off. Um, and so Pablo interviewed him on Friday because they were anticipating Alabama beating Georgia and all of this happening. Right. Um, and so, but it was an interesting, I mean, the guy, the, the guy that was on the committee really sort of toes the party line yeah. um, about what they do. And, but it gives you a little bit of insight into the process. Um, yeah. So it is I called saw, Pablo Torre finds out and it, the episode name is, the secret formula of the college football playoff committee. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine an MIT professor, math yeah. professor, um, right. wanted to talk about formulas a lot. Um, but like from his perspective, he, you know, he said, I don't know anything about how the money works. He said, I can just tell you how we, you know, sort of look. And he wouldn't talk about specific examples of anything. Right. But as far as he was concerned, it was a very pure process and the way he approached it was very pure but i'm sure they're not all like that 
none of us are in the room, first of all, um, when they're making those choices, but it's a really hard. Well, I did see. So one person said something that I saw this morning on the clock app. He's a sportscaster. Um, and he said, which is true. Wasn't it just earlier this season that FSU was trying to get out of the ACC because it was too easy and not enough of a challenge and, didn't they just go to Wells Fargo a few months ago and beg for hundreds of millions of dollars to borrow so they could leave and go to the SEC? So even they admitted early on that it was not a challenging conference to be in. And I'd totally forgot. Talk about, Manny and I were just talking about goldfish brain. Talk about goldfish brain. I'd forgotten that. That they literally three months ago tried to borrow almost $200 million to leave the ACC because it wasn't challenging enough. Uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's just hard. It's just, you know, but then, then you add in, they beat two SEC teams. I agree. You know, like it just, it all, it's hard. I wonder if it was ever an option and I know it would be last minute and I know the logistics of adding games at this point in the season would just be a tremendous feat. However, comma, we're going to do it next year. Right. I wonder if we had added one more layer at the schools, not in bowls necessarily to make it easier to schedule and make it work. I wonder if that crossed their mind. Because adding one more game layer and giving Michigan and um, Washington a bye week would, I think, have helped tremendously. Um, and I don't know, it might not have ever come up. It might not have been a possibility, but I think they should have at least explored it. Yeah, I doubt it was a possibility for this year, but I think it's why they're doing what they're doing yeah. next year. Um, and then I also saw. Uh, I think it was a tweet. I didn't read the whole thing because uh, that's where we live in this world. Yeah. Um, but as I was scrolling through, I did see that, uh, and I probably shouldn't even share this because I don't even remember who tweeted it and I can't cite my source at all. I get on my nephew about this all. Your hair looks great. My hair, y'all. <laughs> when you see the secret picture, you'll know. I get on my nephew about this all the time about citing sources, but whatever it was said that by putting Alabama in that ESPN had was like due to make like 1.6 yeah. billion dollars more because of, you know, ratings and all that. Um, yeah. So then, you know, that, that plays into it as well. Um, it, even if they would never say it out loud, it has to. Oh, I will always buy into a corporate greed argument. Yeah. Same. And then there's that. Have you seen the picture of Herbie on set and the four helmets behind him are the four teams that made it in the playoff? Like ESPN was sending subtle messages inside the room because they were um, all watching the coverage on ESPN. Like, I mean, I'm all for a conspiracy theory. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> That's but, a little much. Yeah. Like, um, I don't think Herb Street is, first of all, smart enough, God love him, to think, oh, we want these four teams. Let me put the helmets behind and I, we will send them a subtle message. So funny. I don't think that happened. I'm in a, a text thread with my friends, Kelly and Casey, who both went to George Tech. And they were making the point, why do we not just pull Michigan out since they cheated uh, and put FSU in, cheaters shouldn't be awarded with a bowl game. Just same. pull them out and put FSU in. Same. I, that thought crossed my mind more than once. Like, why are we even talking about Michigan? I think that's why Harbaugh took the punishment. Yeah. Because he knew if he didn't, they would do it for him. And it might have been the bowl. Um, but he gets to come back for those. Lord. I know, I know, I know. So, I? um, you know, I'm an investigative journalist, right? Um, and 
<laughs> you know, I'm always thinking ahead for this podcast because, you know, I don't have anything else to do. Well, that's not true, but you do think well, ahead. I mean, I do. I, I do think ahead. It. I, I do think it is, uh, that is not something I'm capable does of. Not. But I lo- look, that's why we're the perfect pair of people for this. But there is something that I'm going to share with y'all. There's a great story. I don't even told Mandy all this. There's a family story, um, I, maybe the week of Christmas. Anyway, I ha- there was something old that I was looking for that I found. And to do that, I had to dig through some boxes and I found some of the best family pictures and so my christmas break project is going to be to go through these boxes that i have and um frame some old pictures i found and i knew i had it but i hadn't laid eyes on it in a while i found a picture of my great grandmother who i'm named after kitty Catherine, with her best friends getting dressed for some party it's a candid picture oh how fun she's in her slip and they are laughing uproariously oh that's awesome and it's from like uh, it has to be the 40s the early 40s mm-hmm. because i mean she's fairly young ish but they're just having the best time and uh, all the other pictures I have of family are very, you know, back in the day when all this was new, they posed and sat for it and were very, right. they rarely even smiled in these things. And um, Kitty is just, they're having a ball. And it's uh, awesome. one of the few candid pictures I have like that. And I'm just, I uh, treasure it. Um, I found a picture of a McAfee candy company, 18 um, wheeler <laughs> full of candy. Um, with the McAfee Candy Company um, name on the side Uh, I found my grandmother's pledge class picture love it and the national convention little pamphlet for five years where did Gogi go to school Mercer honey Mercer. and I used her pen so I have your chapter name Alpha Iota Alpha Iota on my pen because it's gogies um I, they're just some treasures some treasures in those pictures and in those records some things on typewriter that's the thing i'm holding out on um for our christmas episode because it's amazing um and i, I just so i'm gonna that's my christmas project y'all hold my feet to the fire on this okay. i'm gonna go through and frame things like it yeah, I'm so excited. I was excited to find it. Very nice. Very so that's, nice. That's my um Christmas break project. Now, the other thing, and I have questions for you, Mandy, on this. Legal questions. So put on your lawyer hat. Okay, this is not legal advice. But no, I'll- no, no. Just questions. Okay. End game. Do you know the book by Obed Scobie? I know the song by Taylor but, Swift. I know, right? So our friend, I use that term very loosely, Omid, put out another book about the Sussexes. Oh, uh, no, I don't know. You don't know this? Oh, man. Okay. Well, maybe we've I'll actually, introduce it and you can do a little research this week. We've actually never had a conversation about the Sussexes. But anyway, go ahead. We have not. No, we haven't. We haven't interesting i think we don't agree on them but that's okay really really well i just know a narcissist when i see one (laughs) anyway keep going okay so omid first of all omid god love you you're so cute and all but like it's time to back away from the fillers if you ever have seen omid scoby do not know who this person is he's he writes all these controversial books for the Sussexes. He, By he the just, way, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> who aren't quite as into the Royals as we are, the Sussexes are Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan. He, look, I don't, he's too young to have that much filler in his face. He is, he still has his bloom. I think there's a universal edict 
just in general, we can say everybody needs to step away from the yeah. filler. I mean, there's so much and, behind and listen, his eyebrows that he friends, looks like the caveman. Friends, if y'all have a friend who's way too into the fillers and you're not telling them, I'm going to need you to step up. Yeah. You need to be a better friend. Bless him. So clearly he has some self-esteem issues because he's filled his face full of crap. Um, so in the Dutch version of the book, it names Charles. Okay. Pause. Pause. Yeah. Friends, I just need y'all to hear that again. Katie is talking about a book written about the Sussexes. Yeah. And she has just said in the Dutch version oh, of the I book. cannot. Continue. <laughs> I cannot believe you have not heard this because it's all over the news, like all over the news. <laughs> In the Dutch version of the book, it names Catherine and Charles as the people who asked about the skin color of the baby. Okay, I did see a mention of this yes. on Twitter, but I didn't have enough energy to dig in to figure out what they were talking about. So he was on, Omid was on, the writer was on British television. And he said out loud, the Dutch version is not my book. I don't speak Dutch, which I get. I don't either. But <laughs> names are the same, honey bun names are the same so, so he's saying he doesn't stand behind that because he does no he's saying he didn't know it was getting printed because it's illegal or something in the the uk has some weird laws right about privacy and things so it's not in the english version but only in the dutch version did it name the people and i'm like honey bun Names are the same or at least close enough. Like of all, if I ever hear anyone speak words that are of another language, I know when they say the name, yeah. when I'm reading a book but in another name, language, I know when it says a name. <laughs> but if the names were not in there. In no, the they were. The version, in the British they, version. Yeah. Um, they were oh i thought you just said they couldn't not promise. in the british version but in the dutch version somebody knew what they were doing is what um, i think okay well i'm still so confused yeah so were the names in the british version no so here's my, what i was saying is uh -huh. if they weren't in there at all then in the dutch version they went in and added names so it's not like a translation issue it's well, where they added something in so there are three theories that they were added incorrectly, that they got an earlier version of the manuscript that they translated before names were taken out altogether. Yeah. But isn't it interesting that those were the only two left in? <laughs> and I forgot what the third one was I heard that made sense too. But any one of those could be um I fully believe correct. it's true. I have no doubt it's Charles that asked that question. So if it was asked in a way, if it was asked in a way that was derogatory, a hundred percent, they should be ashamed of themselves. How could it not be derogatory? Because I asked just the other day for a friend that had a baby. I wonder if they're going to have your hair or his hair. I wonder if they're going to have your beautiful eyes or his eyes. If it's a mixed race, maybe I hope they have beautiful skin that is a, a, that beautiful caramel color. It can be in a way that is not. Now, from Charles, if it had been Philip, I would have said 100% because Prince Philip was known for being kind of an, we're explicit, a low key asshole um, and not very low key most of the time. But Charles, I don't know if it would have been derogatory because he's done a lot of work to help people of color in Britain over the years. It's not well publicized, but he has. I don't know. I, just, I don't know. In that, given the, in that situation, 
given what they have been through in the British press, what, I mean, the way that, so again, for those of you who aren't as into <laughs> the royals as we may be. I just like the jewels. It was reported that before Archie, Harry and Meghan's son was born, and help me because again details yeah um somebody in the family was it right after archie was born or was no, it, before it was before when they found out she was pregnant yeah somebody said i wonder what color the baby's skin will be basically right and it was taken instead of i wonder if it'll be a redhead or have her beautiful brown hair because she's gorgeous I wonder if it'll be skin, her skin color or his. It was taken as, I am concerned that the British royal family will now have a black person in it. And I just don't see how it could have been taken any other way. Given and what, I don't, and I, don't, I mean, we all ask that question in our heads, whether we want to admit it out loud or not. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Oh, I've just, I, we're going to have to do, like I said, I don't think we agree on the Sussexes. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a Sussex issue though. Like I could, if you were to have a baby with somebody, anybody, it doesn't matter who it was. I would think, oh my gosh, are they going to get her amazing Auburn hair? I get, and I take your point. I get your yeah. point and I take your point. And also they're not, cause this is not natural. Um, <laughs> but what I'm saying is you can't, look at that situation yeah in a vacuum and given right. the circumstances surrounding that situation and how important what we've learned like through the crown and well the crown's like, fiction through harry's book and through Which you is, know other i don't other know books what we have learned is what a machine mm -hmm. the british monarchy is and what a close relationship that machine running the monarchy has with the press. And so given how yeah. important that relationship is between those two entities, I don't see how anybody, I mean, it's like you said, we all think that, but like you don't freaking say it. And if you say it, you're a jerk and a racist and an asshole. Peace out. Full stop. It's what I, I just, think. I mean, I think there's a, for me, I could say it and not mean it in any way racist at all. And be hopeful that it was a beautiful, multiracial, gorgeous human being with lots of different color and ethnicity represented in it. Yeah. And like I said, I get that for you. I don't get that for anybody that's a member of the British royal family. Mm, okay. I, <laughs> I not see that completely. I do. But Megan's also a narcissist. So I don't <laughs> trust her. I don't trust any of them, frankly. <laughs> I just want them to wear tiaras and keep their mouth shut. Can we just do that? <laughs> Lord. No, they can't. They cannot. Can't. They have proven it. Yeah. Uh. yeah. Well, I just okay <laughs> it's a it's a real interesting situation and i don't think we will ever know the truth of it oh gosh no no we will not that, i think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle just listen there's one thing you practice law long enough you learn in a hurry there is his side her side and the truth is somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. always i don't yeah. care how honest your client thinks they're being it, right it's not fully on their side ever yeah. um i will tell you what the truth is in my house tell it <laughs> is uh we sold the crazy <gasps> house that's right oh my gosh my favorite thing that you have put on social media is a video of yourself in a dark hall <laughs> walking toward a mirror i was like that is the most like i don't know meta art house movie 
thing I've ever seen. It was amazing. Walking, walking through the most 80s bathroom oh, you've ever oh, seen towards girl. the mirrored wall that uh, fronts the gigantic walk-in master closet. I was walking through the house one last time, honestly, to be sure that nobody had broken in. Turns out they had broken in earlier in the weekend uh -huh. the the buyer's real estate agent had been there and had already closed their window i mean these people y'all um but yeah so big news of my week is signed everything on monday got the check yesterday or the wire so, woo, so is it done like are you done with the mm -hmm. estate or or you're mm -hmm. part of it no just that and we were we were i don't even know like the foreclosure hearing um, was scheduled for Friday. So we closed on Monday before it went into foreclosure, like on Friday, like, woo, exactly. Um, we had a, the contract was uh, in jeopardy for a little bit because after the inspection, we found out the whole house is eaten up in termites. <laughs> Welcome of course to the South. <laughs> lord so but anyway but we made it Shoo! and it is done now there's still another there's also a, a beachfront property um that we have to deal with that really needs to be torn down to the studs um and her she's fighting with her sister she's fighting she's passed away i am she now yeah um, they were fight she and her sister were already sort of fighting about their dad's estate so there's a couple issues with that that we have to get worked out and then we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do about the guy who had my job before me and whether we're oh, going to see yeah. him or not. So, um, so this is a big hurdle, but it's not the final hurdle. Exactly. But it's, it's the, you know, anybody who's ever dealt with buying and selling real estate knows what a huge relief it is. Especially these days. Woo, Lord. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Nope. So that was, that was my big news. And uh little Ronnie, uh the foster dog is doing great she's sweet as pie um she's got that respiratory virus uh, going around it's not bad but it's you know thought i had a thought i had, you know, had a heartworm free dog didn't think i had to worry about the lungs but do you get her like do they does she already come like is it kennel cough or is it a different respiratory thing it's similar to kennel cough um i read it i did actually read an article about it <laughs> i did read the article the um it's the the, the two, this like there's one that's going around that's more severe than your typical kennel cough mm. um and i don't know so i was supposed to that i was actually supposed to get freddie um when i got ronnie i was supposed to get freddie who was going to have his final heartworm treatment and then I was going to get him, but he got kennel cough. Um, oh. so he couldn't have his final heartworm treatment. So that's why I got Ronnie. But so we know it was it. And they were at the same vet. Uh. They were at the same vet. So we know it was at the vet. So it's probably what she has. Cause it's really contagious. Oh yeah. Um, it's like, they just have to like touch noses. Um, yeah. and that's, they get it. So, but other than that, she's doing great. She's fine. Um, Good. um and it's just you know tis the season um i went went and saw the messiah at uh, my church. you are very controversial these days oh my lord so i went and saw the messiah um it was great it was a great performance it was the northwest florida symphony orchestra and chorale um and i grew up so my dad was a choir director. He got his PhD. Well, he got his master's at Georgia State. And then he got his PhD at Florida State. And many of the people who were his professors in both of those degrees were disciples of Robert Shaw, who was the longtime um director of the atlanta symphony orchestra and the corral and the robert shaw corral and he won a kennedy center honor he's won a cabillion grammys like he is the end all be all and a cabillion he, a cabillion okay. 
Um, and he is my dad's <laughs> idol. Anything that Mr. Shaw did, my dad was going to do. Yeah. Like, stop. Um, and Mr. Shaw would come to Florida State quite often because, like I said, a lot of the professors there were um, disciples of his. And so he would come and do concerts at Florida State and my dad's choirs would be invited to sing there. Um, so they just had a great relationship. And every other year, my dad would hire a bunch of Atlanta Symphony Orchestra musicians to come to Moultrie and they would do uh, the, my dad's choirs would sing with the orchestra um, and soloists from Atlanta the entire Christmas portion of the Messiah. Um, so anybody that grew up in Atlanta and ever went and saw the Messiah at Atlanta Symphony Hall knows that Mr. Shaw did not believe in standing up during the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, the whole way yes ma'am goodness gracious she just saw something she's excited over here um hey baby girl Woo! yeah um but so the messiah was debuted they debuted it in dublin but the first time they performed it in london king george stood up during the hallelujah chorus nobody knows my why favorite story this is my favorite nobody story. knows why but he stood up and so of course when he stood up everybody else stood up because everybody else has to stand up there is talk that he was standing up to go to the bathroom. That's why he stood up. As one does. There are other stories. Long performance. Right. There are other stories that he was so moved that that's why he stood up. But nobody knows for sure. And so Mr. Shaw researched it and came up with his decision that you should not stand up during the Holly Chorus. So guess what? In Moultrie, Georgia, we did not stand up for the Holly Chorus. There was a note in uh every program performed please do not stand like that's just what we do so now every time i go and see the messiah i have a hard time standing up for the yeah. holly chorus i typically do because everybody else is and then you just look like adult but anyway yeah. so i posted a little video on facebook from and i didn't sit long because they did invite us to sing along and you know that's all it takes for me to stand up sure um, but I posted a little short little clip of a video of me sitting down and uh, the people's butts uh, in front of me because they saw were that. Mm -hmm. And I said something about you can take the girl out of Georgia, but she's still going to sit down for the Hallelujah Chorus. And a girl that I grew up with, like she's probably, I don't know, five years younger than me, maybe six years younger than me, but we went to church together. Like she you should know. Full Moultrie. She. Y'all, it was the funniest thing. She got so offended at me sitting down for the Holly <laughs> I wanted to stir the pot so bad, too, but you said no, so I respected you. Oh, uh, and then she went on her page and she posted something on her Facebook page oh, the Holly Chorus. True choir kids know that you stand up for the. That's uh, where she went sideways. I, it, it tickled me. All of a sudden, the Holly Chorus was the national anthem, and I'm calling Kaepernick. Like, how did this happen? <laughs> yes, you are, ma'am. You are 100% the Kaepernick of choir world. <laughs> and also, who cares? Who cares? It's just, I mean, <laughs> he was just going to pee. Right? Oh, my God. And then, so then somebody else weighs in and says, well, I stand for the glory of God. Oh, Hallelujah. oh. I mean, it was like, all right, people, oh. why don't you stand for every song? I was about to say, the glory of God is around us all the time, and I don't have the energy or the core strength to stand up all day long every day. It's tickled me. The things, the things we get all worked up about. But yeah, she was like, I was taught, I was taught to always stand for the Hallelujah Chorus. And listen, y'all, I know this child. Only time she saw the Hallelujah Chorus was in Moultrie. With or your daddy. Every now and then we would take a yellow bus to Atlanta and watch it in Atlanta. Those are the only two places that child grew up seeing the Hallelujah Chorus. And, and so, so I know she, well, know she did not know. That she did not learn that. But anyway. That, oh, was, that just made my week when that popped up. Yeah, and Katie, Katie wanted to like reply. She sent me a text. It was like, can I stir the pot? And I was like, no. Right. If it I had didn't. been her sister, I would have let you because her sister. I wanted to sister. so bad though, but you knew what I wanted to do, so that's all that matters. Yeah, I had your back. I know. Thank you, ma'am. 
Thanks, man. <laughs> we ride it down. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> hmm. Oh, Lord. Oh, well, so now, friends, we're going to embark on, mm. as we are in this lovely season of not standing up for the Holly Accord. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, and we listen, we know it's the season of gift guides and everybody and their brother is telling you what to buy, and what, you know, all that. So we are kind of taking a different approach and we wanted to share with y'all some food items that you can gift because that's really sort of yeah one thing i hate about christmas is how the consumerism yes. just takes over and so yes. like i my poor sister you know who was full on single mom um she's been married for two almost two years now um but full-on single mom doing it all working full-time trying to make christmas magic and jane caldwell made christmas magical y'all so there was a lot like we, we are ridiculous at christmas but like i can remember getting to nashville you know like two days before christmas and my sister and i just having to do nothing but run from store to store to store to store to store because we didn't have enough for this version we didn't have enough for that and like that is just just let's all take a breath yeah and just stop and so one of my favorite things to do is to make um food gifts for my friends and take them and then actually share them together and have a minute and everybody take a minute to enjoy oh yeah the real reason for the season as they like to say well, and two, I think every good Southern woman, ha- and a lot of men I know, have that go-to, like, anytime, anytime there's a baby born or a right. new neighbor. Um, food is always a great welcoming. Let us break bread together is a great way to make community. And so um, I think Christmas is the perfect opportunity to do that as well. So, um, and like Mandy said, we... Um, when we started this podcast, we didn't just want it to be an Amazon storefront with our favorites, um, which a lot of other podcasts do, and that's good for them. And we appreciate that. And I have bought things that they have recommended, but that's why last week we really wanted to curate places that were local and not just random online where, you know, that everybody has access to. Um, and this week we wanted to do something a little different. So, um, as we like to say, it's all about the story. So I will definitely have all the recipes are on here. Um, but um, I thought I would share two um, foodstuffs um, that were real good stories um, from my growing up. Um, Gogi's go-to dish were actually uh, cheese muffins. And they are nothing but dairy and white flour <laughs> um, and they're so good and I spent a lot of her last year's grating cheese for her because you don't use pre-grated oh, it does not sad. work I tried to prove her wrong in that and she laughed at me when it didn't work um so and she had arthritis real bad so I would go grate the cheese and eventually she'd have me mix it as well oh, yeah. um she would slip that in you know Oh, while you're here, can you just mix it too? Yes, ma'am. And then eventually she also, if it was raining, she would have me deliver it at Christmas. Um, but they're just these little cheese muffins that everybody loved and everybody associated with Gogi. And so when she passed away, the one thing I wanted was the bowl and the spoon that she used to make these cheese muffins. And y'all, she made so many batches of cheese muffins over the years that the spoon was ground down to perfectly fit the inside of the bowl Mm -hmm. and I will definitely post a picture of it um, in our uh, find your people Instagram but it just not those things are very sentimental to me and I'm very thankful to have them but I think the symbolism and the 
the fact that she did so much for so many people for so many years it wore the the metal spoon down Mm -hmm. to fit the bottom of the bowl that's awesome and i think we should all strive to do that and whatever we do we should give enough where our spoons fit perfectly inside of our bowls absolutely Um, i'm gonna try not to cry (laughs) um it's just the time of year i miss her so much yeah yeah that's um, what made me feel guilty I should have put on I didn't include my dad is famous for his pimento cheese oh well you can totally add it so we used to give to. that out at Christmas a lot and that was the same thing like we had to yep. he he has a special cheese like a rotary yes. cheese grater and then when my grandfather died he got because it was my grandfather's recipe but yeah. my dad got the yellow plate because Mac would make it on a plate not in a bowl right oh same but yeah, so I had to have a, yeah, you have to have the, you have to use hoop cheese, hoop cheese, yep, hoop cheddar, and you yep. have to use a rotary grater and make yep. it on a plate. It doesn't, so even now when I make them, I use the same spoon and bowl, they don't taste the same. Oh gosh, no. The other thing, she was very precise. I mean, the woman was a, the definition of OCD, <laughs> the definition of it. She used... Because they they used to make a certain size block of cheddar cheese. They don't make it anymore. And so um, she would have to buy either, if we were doubling it, it was a big and a little block. If we weren't, uh, she had we had to cut the block. And she used, I swear to goodness, my uncle, who is almost 70 years old, his wooden ruler from elementary <laughs> school to measure the block of cheese (laughs) and cut two thirds of it (sighs) and she would like i didn't cut it straight enough so she would score it where i I mean like it was wild but that's how (laughs) diligent she was about the things that she gave away she wanted to be perfect yeah which just cracks me up sorry (laughs) gogi cracks me up i don't do it like that sorry um but uh, her cheese muffin recipe is so easy. It's these are the ingredients. I won't go. I'll y'all have the whole thing. Um, I do find it interesting. I do have the original. First of all, I have the original handwritten framed in my kitchen, um, and um, in our family cookbook, it's not quite right. So um, somebody, I don't think she listens. My mother um, made it so he couldn't quite get it right when you cooked it out of the family cookbook. <laughs> But he, it's two sticks, two sticks of butter melted, uh, eight ounces of sour cream, two cups of self-rising flour sifted, and then two cups of grated sharp cheddar cheese packed. Um, I just use a block. Uh, I measure with my heart when I measure cheese. <laughs> um, but there are some tips in the, the recipe about how to make them. And they're in the little Come mini. On. The little mini muffin tins. Yeah, my mom used to make those a lot without the cheese. Like they didn't have cheese. Yeah, like a sour cream muffin. Uh Yeah, that's in the family cookbook too. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The other um, recipe that I wanted to just tell you the little story about, because they're hilarious, is Miss Baldry cookies. Now, Miss Baldry and my grandmother played bridge together for like 65 years. Um. And they were, uh, Miss Baldry revolted and became an Alpha Delta Pi at Mercer. Uh Uh-oh. But they also grew up together. They went to high school together. So they've been friends forever. So Miss Baldry is this dear woman who is an award-winning chef, like entered all the contests back in the 50s and 60s and won all these great cooking contests. And so these are like, these are bar cookies and they've got caramel and chocolate. And we, I don't know what they're supposed to be called, but we call them Miss Baldry cookies. And this was her go-to gift. Gogi used to have to hide them (laughs) from my grandfather because we would go in like at Thanksgiving or Christmas when she had a batch of them that Miss Baldry had given her and they would be gone because (laughs) Morris had been sneaking them. (laughs) <laughs> especially when he started to get alzheimer's and forgot that he wasn't supposed to sneak them they would be gone there would be none left that's so funny 
One of my favorite Miss Bowdry stories, though, was my brother bought uh, his first little house in Macon. And he had just started dating the girl that's now his wife, Rebecca. And they came home from a date and on his back door hung this little plastic bag and inside um, were cookies and with a note that said, congrats on your new home. Love, Becky. Well, we called all my grandmother's friends by their first name. And Rebecca said, who the heck's Becky? (laughs) And Charlie died laughing and said, well, she's about 80. And she's about (laughs) four foot nothing with about another foot of hair. And so, (laughs) anyway, it's one of my favorite stories about Miss Bowdry. And then um, when I was 19 years old, I had surgery. um, And Miss Bowdry brought me cookies. And Charlie ate them all. Well. Yeah. That is unacceptable. Very unacceptable. But. Um, those cookies have been just part of the story of my life they're so good Um, her recipes I would not say are the easiest in the world there are several steps to these but they are worth every single step yeah so so good Um, the other things that I have on my list um, I just made a batch of this that I keep Um, mom calls it Russian tea mix I don't know why it's Russian tea but it's um, tang and lemonade and um, tea and cinnamon and clove uh, and sugar of course Uh, I drink it throughout the winter I had a really hard time finding the anything that wasn't like a crystal light packet of lemonade like you can find the frozen kind, but it, you, the granulated, I had a hard time finding it mine. So I just got the instant tea with lemon in it oh, well, and that's just that. fine. It works just fine, but I enjoy it throughout the season. Um, I make these Cheez-Its. In fact, I'm making them today because my Methodist studies friends request them for every gathering that we ever have. And so I'm going to put some in the oven in just a little bit. They are delicious. They are so easy. I was given them a, several years ago now as a gift. And I was like, I have got to have that recipe, but it's just ranch dressing and some oil to, and you bake them. So easy. So good. It's good to have to grab at the house to nibble on. They remind me of, um, for all my Noonan friends, there's a great restaurant on the square in Noonan called the Redneck Gourmet. Ooh. And Miss Seal, C-I-L-E. Ms. I Seal. love that. Um, Miss Seal makes um, crackers. They're Seal's crackers that you can get. Um, and they're like saltines, but it's not. Yes. I, I don't know what her secret seasoning is. but So a friend of mine brought the basically the same seasoning on saltines the other day to class for us to snack on because you know we have those three hour block classes which are awful um and they were just as good so you could totally put this on saltines and it would be amazing and like a little chicken salad action with that oh there we go there we go Mm -hmm. i love that the other thing i like to make for myself it's a little expensive but it's really good and you can um, definitely use cheaper liquor to do it is making your own vanilla. In fact, I need to vanilla beans have gotten so expensive. Oh, that's the expensive part. Vanilla beans are very expensive, but I'm hoping I'm hoping to make it down to the cat farmer's market. And sometimes their spices are a lot cheaper and so I'm hoping to find them reasonably you know, priced. You know where else you can find vanilla beans sometimes is Costco. Oh, well, I don't have a membership, but my friend does. And we're, that's definitely on my Christmas break list is to make a run to Costco. So I will look there too. But it, it this is how easy it is, friends. You get a container. I just went to Hobby Lobby, I think, and got one with the little rubber seal like a glass jar with a rubber seal and the little metal flip thing put the vanilla bean in i use bourbon but you can use vodka and you pour it in there that's it and then you let it sit the longer the better um but it's time for me to um 
to re-up your vanilla. I can use the vanilla bean several times. Like I just keep filling it up once it's sat for a while, but it's time for me to replace my vanilla bean. So um, it, it's also really good to give away as gifts. If you can find it reasonable, you know, a reasonable price for a vanilla bean, or if you really love your people. The other thing um, I was like, a lot of times when I, like when I first started doing like homemade gifts, part of my challenge was always like the container um to put it in Ikea yes. is another good source for like oh, yeah full little bottles and stuff see so I didn't have an Ikea when I started this process available and um, you can order like you can order um online a lot of Ikea stuff okay um, and yeah. that's you know very but recent. as long as it's one that's got a good seal on it mm -hmm. then you should be good and it'll just you just let it sit in the back of your pantry for several months and then just add a little bourbon when it gets a little low or a little vodka birch and jim make uh limoncello oh uh, i love birch has gotten um containers from ikea for their limoncello love that i need to get on that list <laughs> right <laughs> Um, the last thing I put on here is I thought about, you know, this is pecan season, um, but peach season, this year's peach crop, as we discussed, was not a good one because of a late frost. Um, I was able to get some cause we know some peach, my family knows some peach people. So I put their, um, website on here because they do boxes and, you know, they are a big farm down there, but they're still Georgia local people. And so, um, you know, that's Birch's cousin. No way. When the year is Birch's first cousin. Stop it. <laughs> so they're all best friends with my brother and his wife and oh, my, my, my um, nephew worked there this summer and my don't tell don't tell do not birch i swear to god <laughs> i don't know if he knows but martha is to the oldest niece is totally in love with their son don't tell <laughs> i could be related to the pearsons too okay, i'm already planning the cousins. wedding then you and birch will be cousins oh my gosh birch i knew i liked her <laughs> okay so but they have great stuff Always, if you're in the area, if you are in the area in the summer, go by and get all the things. Get the ice cream, the cobbler, get fresh peaches. The pecans are delicious this time of year. Get them, get them, get them. They're so, so good. Um, but you can order it and they will ship it to you. Also, they have great recipes. So the Pearsons will get it on there. Uh, website um, and they will and on their social media stuff and they'll give you their peach cake recipe and all those things so definitely definitely go on and order some um, some pecans this time of year so good yep and they were probably picked by my nephew I did several years ago um, I actually had ordered it for some friends to send as a thank you and somehow it got shipped to me instead oops um but it was a gift box that they do in the summer that was peaches and pecans mm. like even in the summer yeah so oh yeah 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 if you want to next summer when you're ordering your peaches if you want to throw some pecans in yeah oh they I have pecans year round but nanny and papa all lived in the middle of a pecan orchard i mean they had five acres of pecans yeah so i never bought a pecan in my life mm -hmm. until i was probably 45 yeah it really hurts my feelings to have to buy them yeah yeah but we do what we have to do we do what we have to we sacrifice we do we do yeah. um those were awesome katie I, love I, those. I hope you enjoy i didn't the miss boundary cookies are a little they're multi-step so they're a little bit more complicated but not hard but everything else is super easy so when gogi would deliver her muffins like how would she wrap those oh okay so gogi became a big hobby lobby fan i know we have issues with hobby lobby but she loved a sticker gogi loved a sticker and so she would go and uh, for many many years because she bought a ton of them 
she had these glittery green Christmas tree stickers and she would get the, um, they're almost like takeout containers with the paper lid that you then fold over and she would put a layer of cheese muffins and then she would write on the lid the directions to heat them up. And it always ended with freezes beautifully <laughs> because you can freeze them and pull them out. I challenge any of you to make a batch of these and have any leftover to go in the freezer. Right. Right. I challenge you. But Gogi dished them out like they were, I don't know, gold bullion cubes. And so <laughs> she would tell you how many you would get and make you decide how many you wanted before she made them. Like... <laughs> Pulled them out of the room. How many do you want? Well, I won't. I don't know. A lot. No, you got to tell me a number. So she'd pull out just <laughs> enough. OCD. Um, OCD, Gogi. Um, and then she would pull a Christmas tree sticker. Uh -huh. So it was almost like a Chinese takeout container. Mm -hmm. That's how she delivered them. Okay. I could see wrapping them. You'd have to be real careful too, but like maybe like in cellophane. Yes. So I have done that before. So, you know, they sell those cellophane bags at Christmas, a lot of places with like trees or candy canes or something on them. I've put six of them or 10 of them in mm -hmm. there in the big ones and then wrapped it and tied it with a bow. Mm -hmm. Um, but really I've had people request that I make them and they're like, I don't care what you put them in. I'm coming to get them. We're going to eat them in the car right. on the way home. Right. Right. I'm like, but you're asking me to make them for you for Christmas. And they're like, no, well, I mean, yeah. well, some of them will, but we're going to yeah. eat them on the way home. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. Yep. Oh, uh, oh, uh, okay. So I'll start with one I did last year. It's a this mold. Looks really good. It's a mold wine kit. Okay. Um, and I had never actually had mold wine, but I just thought it was a cool looking little gift. Um, so the first thing you do is you dry oranges. And I put a link in here. Basically, Which all you I do is slice them really thinly and put them on a rack and put them in a low oven um, for a long time. And actually, y'all, I had enough left over that I put them in a little container and it's been a year I still have them in my fridge and I'll pop them in like a cocktail yeah you know um or you see the um William Sonoma like potpourri thing that you can put on yeah. your oven like if you put it in that and heat it up it's so great. do you put them directly on the oven rack or do you no, no, a rack on a cookie sheet a rack on a cookie sheet okay sorry I had to wrap my brain around this because you know I'm gonna do it because everything yeah. Mandy says to do I do um yeah I linked I linked to how to make dried orange slices yep. here I think who I actually used last year was Joy the Baker um who's a great instagram follow if you don't follow joy she just i know i saw <laughs> Katie's pulling out her phone. i know i just saw um that she was drying oranges this week um so she could probably give you some good hints too um and then you just make a kit and i if i recall correctly what i did last year was i put everything in a little mason jar <clears throat> um and then you know, tie that up with a little, I've got some Christmas ribbon that I bought several years ago that I just keep using. Um, and then gave it with a bottle of wine and I ended up, my, I gave it to my friend Carla last year. And then she ended up, I think on new year's, I ended up going over there and we mauled the wine. Oh, I love that. Um, it was good. It was really good. Uh, cause uh, she was like, what do I do? I'm like, I don't know. I've never made it. I just thought it looked like a fun gift. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it worked out great. Um, so yeah, so that's the first one. Um, and if you look, if you watch, um, Whole Foods actually has good deals on wine a lot of times. Okay. Um, like you can get a decent bottle of wine on sale quite often, especially this time of year. Yeah. Um, so just keep an eye there and you can get some decent wine for, you know, a reasonable price. Um, one year I did homemade Irish cream. I um, love this. Which, you know, shocker of all shockers is a Smitten Kitchen recipe. Um, <clears throat> but same thing, it's, Deb's got the recipe there and I just put it in a little mason jar with a little Christmas ribbon. Um, and that was a big hit and delicious. I love uh, Irish cream. I have been gifted that before, but I've never made it. And I do like it in my coffee some Saturday mornings. 
Yeah, it's not, and it's not hard. It's not hard. So I think I might try that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I always do, like, if I'm doing something like that, I'll always pair it with a cookie tray. Um, and so the kids love the, you know, the cookie tray. Right. Um, my rule for the cookie tray is to do something chocolate, something fruity, and then sort of whatever else you want. Um, so. And I think that's a good rule for any party for desserts. Gogi always did that. Um. Y'all would have been best friends, by the way. Um, <laughs> she always liked something, not just fruity, but she was very specific. She wanted something lemon. I, I do not disagree. So she loved a citrus and my mom makes really good lemon bars or there's some lemon poppy seed muffins we used to do to put on the dessert table. So um, I absolutely co-sign on that to have a variety of mm-hmm. the cookies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just some good sources for your, uh, you know, if you're looking at doing a cookie tray, the New York times, <clears throat> I linked an article they did, I think last year of how to make the perfect cookie box. And then they're actually doing like right now it's cookie week. Oh, okay. So they're doing a new, sorry, y'all <clears throat> got a frog in my throat. Got yeah. that respiratory virus. No, um, no one. They, um, are doing a new cookie like every day. Um, so you can get some good ideas there. Also, uh, Grossy Pelosi, if you do not follow Dan Pelosi on Instagram, um, his handle is Grossy Pelosi. He is great. He's a gigantic Italian teddy bear. Um, and his family does cookies every, like a big cookie box every oh, year. How cute is he? And he gives the hint of like, when you make your cookies, if you're doing like a, I don't typically put them in like a box container, but he does. And if you're doing a, a, a like a box that you put a slice of bread on top of the cookies, oh, and yeah. you have them all packed and it keeps the cookies fresh. Yes. <clears throat> so, love that. Yeah. So he's, I love, I can cuss on these super cute. Um, he's he's I just love that. Sweet little, sweet little yep. grassy grassy. He just, in, in fact, he just published his first cookbook love um, that for him yes um but some of the ones that i <clears throat> have done recently i linked to just a couple of specific recipes uh rugelach i do the cherry rugelach with cardamom sugar listen okay anything with cardamom i am in on it okay um, but this is the new york times recipe i think it's a melissa clark recipe um and she's usually pretty easy now it is a dough katie but you can do it it is a dough no i'm I'm afraid of a dough i know you roll it out into a circle and then you just cut little triangles and you spread the the make the filling on it and then you roll it up sort of like a little croissant um and then our girl deb also she has a a good real uh okay um if you wanted to try that one and then last year i did these uh, it was a New York Times salted caramel and peanut butter mm. shortbread. Those are all my favorite things in one cookie. Listen, y'all, they were so good. I will say, when you're one of the things you have to do is you have to pound out your caramel. Oh, like you buy Werther's and you pound them. And I would make them. If there's a there's a fine line there, like you don't want to make them into smithereens because then they just melt into the cookie. But you want them small enough because otherwise they're going to get like they're going to get yeah they're going to pull out all your fillings yeah and it the the cookie doesn't hold together just right so you kind of pay you have to pay kind of special attention to pounding out your caramel but other than that they're very easy and delicious love it and then Will Caldwell always has to have a um peanut butter blossom you know just mm. a peanut butter cookie with a Hershey Kiss in it those are oh yeah required uh, yeah Dougie used to make those too so good so good um and then what I'll do is I'll get just a you know Hobby Lobby Michaels wherever you know just get a big tray um and put some cookies on it and then get like the cellophane that comes on a roll yeah and just wrap them in that and tie them up is usually how I uh deliver those um although Lewis and Julie were recently at my mother's 
she was sick at Thanksgiving. And so they were over there doctoring her and taking her a plate of food. My cousin, Lee Caldwell, owns a um, scone company, Highland Scone Company in Birmingham. And they make great scones. That's another. Should we should link them. that. We should. Um, but my mother had apparently had seven of their tins they ship them in these gold tins and my mother had seven seven skin tins and they got rid of them i was like why'd y'all do that i ah. couldn't use them for my cookies oh they don't think so if you don't have yeah. a highland scone tin you can just get you know in any sort of plate and just wrap it with that cellophane yeah. i think yeah. i bought that cellophane maybe three years ago four it may have been before covid even um and i'm still using it every year so i love it i love it we'll definitely link that in the show notes um so we'll we can order scones from your family i love that, I love that. of course there are people in the food business <laughs> um so we have not done favorites in a couple of weeks um because we had thanksgiving and then last week we told you all hey baby girl <laughs> the puppy is all up in some faces um so we haven't done it in a while. So I thought I would um, tell you the things that I have loved lately. Oh, besides Ronnie tucking herself up under Mandy. It's amazing. So um, do you Substack? Are you on Substack? Have we talked about Substack on here before? Perch has actually requested that we do a Substack. Uh, I Primer? I don't know what she, okay. she's like, I need to know how to use Substack without it costing me an arm and a leg. Well, good luck with that. All I can say to that is just don't subscribe and get the free newsletter. Yeah. So several people are on here that I really like, and I, I thought I would share those things with you. One of them I pay for because it's a great sermon starter, and I'm hoping my accountant can figure out how to write that off on my taxes, even though it's not that much. <laughs> Every little bit helps because apparently I'm an independent contractor now and I have to pay taxes out the yin yang. Um, the first thing that I love that I don't pay for, but every once in a while I go, oh, I really want to manage my subscription and read the rest of this article is called Poetic Outlaws. And they look, it's a really good mix of um, traditional, like Henry David Thoreau was on there today. Um, but they have newer poets. Um, again, this for me, it's, um, well, I love words, obviously, but because um, I write a lot, but it's also a great way to be inspired. Um, and it's so poetic outlaws. They have a wide variety of really great poetry um, that is beautiful. I'm going to subscribe to that for sure. I love poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll love it. Um, the other thing that I love that one of my professors actually turned me on to is called Letters of Note. And it is um, a weekly subscription. And they publish these random, lovely letters from history. Um, the one that my professor... Um, used in our class that I love so much and it's just so beautifully ironically written and you know I love sarcasm and irony was a letter from a former slave to his former master he had um, gotten out of slavery was living up in the north and his master um, shockingly couldn't run the plantation without him <laughs> and he was wanting him to come back <laughs> And the letter of reply that this beautiful human wrote was just amazing. Um, so that's what turned me on to it. But there are so many. Um, some of them are snippets of letters about a certain subject from people that you would know. Some you might not know. Um, some of them are full published letters. Um, from famous people there's um, one from Ernest Hemingway during the war when he's very young um, some of Lincoln's obscure letters have come through it's just a beautiful collection of writings so it's called letters of note highly recommend and our buddy 
Smitten Kitchen is on there. And so that's how I keep up with her. Um, I have her on my socials, but this, it puts it right in front of me because I don't do a lot on Substack. So it's not lost in the volume that it is everywhere else. And so um, I highly recommend, highly recommend. Agree. Those three. Um, The other thing that I've loved these days are two um, podcasts. One I know we haven't talked about um, when we were talking about Royals earlier. There's one called Pod Save the King. It used to be called, huh, wait for it, Pod Save the Queen. <laughs> and it's two, well, one of them is definitely a royal reporter and the other one started interviewing reporters um, in the Royal Rota. It's a really good look um, at like, it, it's everything from fashion to, um, you know, they don't pull any punches when they don't agree with something that they don't do. They talk about it. Um, it's how I keep up a lot with them. Um, one guy that's one of the reporters on there um, is one that travels with the Royals. And so he has a really interesting take on what it's like to be traveling with them. And um, he's not really pro or con Sussex. So I think he's got a real good look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other one is Batch. So I had subscribed on my podcast to the Bitter Southerner podcast, but they quit making that. And it didn't even, I didn't notice two years ago or three years ago. They've switched over to one called Batch. And I listened to the latest episode. It's a seasonal one. So they're not producing right now. It is really good. So okay. I'm sure, Mandy, that you're much better at keeping up with that than I am. No, I didn't know. But it's called Batch. It's really good. Uh, the other thing that I love the Better Southerner and follow them on my socials, but I never subscribed to the newsletter. And I went in there. I was like, how am I? What have I done? So when I ordered my, my life, well, I ordered my sweatshirt that says, bless your heart. I was like, I'm doing all the things. So I went in and that's when I realized that Batch was their new, the name of their new thing and what it doesn't do some of them if they change the name of it or have a new season with a different name it'll automatically keep you subscribed this is a whole new thing and so that's why i missed it so make sure you're following that um it's so good the other thing that i have loved you know mandy and i've said it over and over it is so true the main reason i love sports so much is well i'm a competitor (laughs) More so than Mandy, but I love a good story and I do not follow the NFL at all. I don't watch NFL football much at all, unless Taylor Swift is going to be there. But what I love on HBO Max is a show called Hard Knocks and they have followed several teams and right now they are in a mid-season season of Hard Knocks following the Miami Dolphins. And it is very current. Like they, I just watched one this morning. I watched the latest episode this morning and it was from the game like last week. So it's very mm-hmm. current. And if you don't know Mike McDaniel, their coach's story, you need to know it. He's quirky. He said about 47 cuss words in the first 30 seconds of the first episode. And I was like, <laughs> okay, that's what, that's how we roll. Um, he wears joggers. He, yeah, is, he looks like a little tech, tech dude out there. Yes. Okay. He's got these big glasses. He wears a more product in his hair than I do. He is just the cutest little thing, but he has a great backstory. And if you don't know it, you need to research it and read about it. He's a recovering alcoholic. He's net brought himself back from some really bad places. Uh, he's got a beautiful wife and a great little family, and he's just doing great at Miami. And now I'm a Miami Dolphins fan for a minute. <laughs> but if you go back and look like Michigan was one of the few college teams they did. And Jim Harbaugh, I love Jim Harbaugh, but it's because of hard knocks and That's the little, it, the as story. expected in the, have you seen that episode that season? Okay. You need to go watch it because as expected in the very last episode, they go into Jim Harbaugh's closet and it's all I, khakis. It's at, swear to God, hand to Jesus. It is rose of khakis 
and blue sure. <laughs> of varying weather needs. That's it. Listen, that gives you room to make other decisions with your brain if you're not having to figure out what they to wear. showed it. I howled laughing when it came on. That's funny. Yeah. So that's a great. I think um, sports documentaries are wonderful. HBO does a really good job with them. Hard Knocks. Highly recommend. And the last thing is that Kurt Herbstreit's dog is having a moment. <laughs> this season, he has started bringing his um, oldest dog, Bo, to all the games and all the college game days. And Bo is this beautifully quaffed. They must spend a fortune grooming that dog. Um, Golden Retriever, who is old. He's got the gray snout. He's old and sweet and wonderful. And he just rolls over and let everybody scratch his belly. He, there was one where, what now? Just has a big time. He does. There was one where, and I'm, well, I'm not a George fan at all, but the, where he's meeting Ugga. It's the <laughs> cutest little thing. They've like bump noses and boop each other. It's so cute. So um, watch out for Bo the dog. I'm loving I started, him right I now. I started following Herb Street on Instagram just because of Bo. Just because of I Bo. I to see what Bo was doing. He lives in Nashville, I believe. They, listen, remember I saw his, when I was getting my facial, they had a picture of Herb Street. On oh, the that's wall. right. That's when I discovered Birch is a Herb Street mm -hmm. lover. He is, look. His boys went to NBA. He's good looking. Um, yeah, now I'm out. I'm trying to figure out where they live. I'm stalking Bo. He's got yeah. two other. They did a story on him on game day. He's got two other younger dogs, but they're so like wild and rambunctious that they can't yeah. handle um being on set. But Bo oh. the dog is my new favorite dog. Well, so no, no, except for Ronnie. Sorry, Ronnie. She's sleeping. She didn't She's sleeping. Me. She didn't hear me. Okay. Yeah. She doesn't know her name either. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> oh, Lord. Maybe so those are my good. favorites. That was awesome. That was good. It was fun. A little long. A little long today. Yeah, look. We got recipes. We got stories. Tis the yeah. season. Yeah. But, uh, well, friends, we hope y'all have a great week. Thank you for listening. Yes. I will not be in pajamas next week, maybe. Um, I'll be in Macon next week. So, okay. yeah, I'm going down for a, a party. So, we'll talk about that next week, I'm sure. That's It'll just be thinking, fun. What, what day is Wednesday? Okay, that should work. We may have to record it late. We'll have to talk. Oh, we'll yeah. Talk. Whatever. Yeah. Because I got a good thing. And yeah. What we can look. We, the best thing about doing this, first of all, is that I get to catch up with Mandy every week. The second best thing is we give each other so much grace. <laughs> like she has looked at me unshowered in pajamas for over an hour now, and she is still my friend. Listen, like I said, that's how you should look when you yeah. have that. You have, hope it all goes well. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a large volume, but I think I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. I have confidence in you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right friends well all everybody right. have a good week have a great week and we will see you next week merry christmas everybody happy hanukkah if you you celebrate. brooker, brooker. <laughs> climb that tree and hang that star babe <laughs>